Uh, hi everybody, today I wanna to look at a nice a rotational dynamics problem. It's a simple yo-yo problem. I've got it sketched out here on the whiteboard. Um, so we have a cylinder which has a particular moment of inertia. There is a rope or a string wound around that cylinder and you're simply gonna drop the object. So the weight is pulling it down and you've got the tension acting on the side. Let's calculate after it falls a certain height, H, let's calculate how fast the center of mass of the yo-yo is moving. Uh, we could do this problem using two different ways. You can use uh, Newton's laws, or you can look at the torque produced by that tension and then calculate what the acceleration is. Then use our kinematic equations to calculate the speed. Or we can use conservation of energy. So we'll do it both ways. So let's have a look at this problem. All right, so let's first look at this problem using Newton's laws. So for this problem, initially I'm just gonna drop the object, so that means that the velocity of the center of mass has to be equal to zero, and the angular velocity is also equal to zero. Now my yo-yo is gonna have a mass m, and the radius, let's just give it a letter r. Now as it's dropping, this is what the free body diagram looks like. It has a weight, the Earth's pulling down on it, and the weight is mg. There's also a tension acting on it. Look where the tension is. The tension's at the edge. That's where the rope is, right? And the string is pulling up on it. And what we want to know is after this yo-yo drops a certain height h, how fast is the velocity of the center of mass? So how fast is the yo-yo moving here? So let's first set it up using Newton's laws. We can first, we can do two things for this free body diagram. We can add up all the torque acting on it, and we can add up all the forces acting on it. So what are all the torque? Well, there's two forces, but only one of them produce torque. It's only the tension that produces torque. And the amount of torque that it produces is the value of the force times the distance to the center. And there's no angle here. You don't have to worry about sine of 90 degrees. And that's it. That's the total torque acting on the system. The weight here doesn't actually produce any torque because it's acting at the center of mass. So we're done. So Newton's second law for rotation says you add up all the torque. That there has to be equal to the moment of inertia multiplied by the angular acceleration. Now the moment of inertia of a cylinder, you can look it up in your book, it's one half the mass of the cylinder and the radius squared. So we know what I is in this equation. Now let's look at the sum of the forces acting on it. Now for this case, I'm gonna choose down to be the positive direction. And if I do that, well, let's set up the sum of the forces here. Only two forces acting on it. There's the weight acting down and there's the tension acting up minus the tension. I add up all the forces. Newton's second law tells me that has to be equal to mass times acceleration. Now, if you look at our equation over here, it looks like we have three unknowns. It looks like the unknowns would be the tension, the angular acceleration, and here, the linear acceleration. That's really the acceleration of the center of mass. It looks like we have three unknowns and only two equations, and this would lead to a problem. You need another equation in order to solve this. However, one important part about this yo-yo problem is if this thing is spinning without any slipping going on, so if there's no slipping, you're able to connect the acceleration to the angular acceleration. And you have this relationship here, that the acceleration of our center of mass is simply equal to the radius times alpha. So now we actually have a third equation that links these three variables here. We can actually do some math in order to solve them. So let's start here with equation, the first equation. Let's call it equation A and equation B. If I isolate tension from equation A, it looks like this. And that's the moment of inertia times the angular acceleration divided by the radius. Now let's substitute what our moment of inertia is. It's one half m r squared. Our angular acceleration here, I can substitute it for the acceleration divided by the radius. That's what alpha was. And at the end, I can't forget here, I still have to divide by the radius. So one thing you notice is that you have radius squared at the top and get rid of it because you have two radii at the bottom here. All right, so at the end, we're left with one half m times a, that's equal to the tension. Now, if I look at equation B, equation B is the weight minus the tension equals to ma. So let me write that here. 
weight minus T equals to the mass times the acceleration. However, now look at, I could substitute what the tension is. And the weight I know is mg, so let's do that. So we have mg over here. We have minus the tension, and the tension I just showed you, it was one half ma. <clears throat> that has to equal to mass times acceleration. Now we group all the terms. Actually, you notice that mass is involved in all the terms. You can get rid of it. I bring this acceleration on the other side. I'm going to be left with little g is equal to a plus one half of a, which gives me three a over two. So the acceleration here, and it's really the acceleration of the center of mass, has to be two thirds times g. That's our acceleration. And I know that the acceleration is constant. So how can I now, now find what the velocity is after you fall a certain distance? So to find the final velocity here, we simply have to remember our, one of our kinematic equations, which says that the velocity squared equals to the initial velocity plus two times the acceleration and times the displacement. In this case, it's simply h. Now, initial velocity is zero. Get rid of that guy. We know the acceleration. We just calculated it's two thirds times the acceleration due to gravity. So that means that our velocity at the end, our velocity squared, let's do an extra step here. We're going to get two multiplied by two thirds, g times h, and the velocity at the end, and it really is the velocity of the center of mass, equals to the square root of all of this term, four thirds g times h. So there's our final answer. That's how fast the center of mass is moving after you drop a yo-yo a certain height age. Notice that it's slower than if you were going to actually just drop it in free fall without the rope attached to it. Actually, if you did that case, what you would find would be that the velocity of the center mass is square root of 2 times gh, which is bigger than this term. All right, let's now solve the same problem now using conservation of energy. Okay, so now for conservation of energy, this is pretty straightforward. It's actually a little bit easier, I find. Again, we're still looking for the velocity of the center of mass, but initially what you do is, initially if I'm not moving, I have no kinetic energy whatsoever. I have no translational kinetic energy and no rotational kinetic energy. But I'm a certain height above the ground. So what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna set y equals to zero down here, where the center of mass is at the final position. And that means initially, all I have is gravitational potential energy. So let's look at all the energy at one point, and that there has to be equal to the final potential, or the final total energy. Initially, all we have is mg times h, that's our gravitational potential energy. That there has to be equal to the total energy down here at the bottom. There's no frictional forces here. So there are no non-conservative forces. So the final energy then is simply kinetic energy, which is one half uh, the mass of the yo-yo in velocity of the center of mass squared. Now we're not done here, right? We need to also add what is the rotational energy because we also have all of this mass here that's spinning around when it gets to the bottom. So in order to add that term, you have to remember the rotational kinetic energy is given by this one half it looks similar to this one. Instead of mass, we talk about the moment of inertia, and it's the moment of inertia of the disk multiplied by the angular frequency squared. Now, for conservation of energy, it looks like we only have one equation, and it looks like we have two unknowns here. We have the velocity of the center of mass, which is what we're trying to find, but we also have the angular velocity omega. But again, if something is spinning without slipping, which is the key to this problem here, is you can relate both of those. The velocity of the center of mass and the angular velocity are simply related to each other by the radius. All right, so that's it. Now we simply have to do a little bit of algebra in order to simplify this expression. So you get one half m v center of mass squared, I'll leave that term as it is, plus one half. The moment of inertia of the disk is one half. The mass of the disk, the radius squared, and now the omega, 
Our value of omega, I can use this small relationship here, which is simply the velocity of the center of mass divided by the radius. Okay, and all of this here has to be equal to mgh, the gravitational potential energy. So at the end, we have to simplify these terms. We get one half mvcm squared plus, this is going to be one fourth. What's the next term? There's going to be mass. Look what happens to the radius again. You have radius squared here, and you're going to have radius squared once I square everything in this final bracket over here. So our final term is, it's also going to have a velocity of the center of mass squared. Actually, see what happens now is that all of this gravitational potential energy gets divided, right? You get some that gets put into translational kinetic energy, but you get a little bit that's also in rotational kinetic energy over here. So if you just simplify this expression, this is 2 over 4 plus 1 over 4 gives me 3 over 4. m velocity of the center of mass squared equals to mgh. You notice the masses are on both terms. We can get rid of it. And at the end, you simply isolate for the velocity of the center of mass. And lo and behold, surprise, surprise, 4 over 3, g times h. We get the same expression whether you use conservation of energy or whether you use Newton's laws of motion. Hope you like the problem, folks. If you like it, give it a thumbs up. Consider subscribing to my channel. If there's something you don't understand, feel free to leave a comment. I'll make sure to get back to you. Thanks for watching.